<laughs> All right, hello everybody, and thanks for joining us in the Coaches Parlay here on ASTV. I got a full line. I got three forwards. I got two deep. We might have a goaltender showing up. We might uh, we might even pull the goalie. You never know what happens here on the Coaches Parlay. The pregame show, three periods, and of course our final shift here uh, on tonight's episode. We're going to talk a little bit, pretty much a little bit of draft, a little bit of travel talk, maybe some documents. I know Mike was doing some heavy reading on a document over the last couple of days, and we're going to get everyone's insight over the provinces here and figure out when exactly things are going to get going. But I'm going to start off talking with Harry real quick. Harry, what does it feel like the fact that you're the only junior league playing actual regular season hockey right now? I mean, it's exciting. That's kind of the reason why, to be honest, I took the job because they were kind of pretty determined to start when they were. And, uh, yeah, we had two games already regular season, one on both. So I have to admit, once you're in the rink and the puck drops, it feels very normal. So I'm just happy for that. Ryan, you said off the air, not much hockey going on. We're seeing house league players playing with elite players. Well, in in um, in Ontario, basically, there's been a lot of uh, independent stuff popping up. Uh, people. Uh, creating leagues and uh, finding ways for the more elite level players to be able to band together um, kind of uh, outside the auspices of, uh, of Hockey Canada. Um, people are just doing it, calling it training skates so that uh, guys can be prepared to play whenever, uh, whenever that uh, happens here in Ontario. So nothing has really been set, still delays going on. Mentioned earlier this week, uh, the QJs moving its regular season schedule back to the 20th because there's several teams in the hotbed. Mike, let's quickly bring you in. The SJ still no timetable whatsoever. Officially, uh, Officially. no, no timetable. Um, we are optimistic. Uh, that will be going around the 1st of November, if not the 1st of November, maybe uh, a week or so after that. Uh, you alluded to the 65-plus the page document that Sask Hockey has, um, has put out, which, to my understanding, is approved by public health. Um, the, the, uh, the 12 SJHL centers just have to submit some protocols and then get them satisfied by SASC Health. Um, I'm led to believe that, um, aside from, you know, just taking a little bit of time, those, those positive, uh, protocols, um, will be approved and will be allowed to go. Um, there is some discussion and I don't know if this will happen or not, but if you, if you look at the document, which I have, um, there is some interpretation there that if teams wanted to start playing some preseason games, if they're not worried about fans attending and they just wanted to play preseason games without fans, they maybe could do that as soon as this weekend, but that remains to be seen. Sean, have you heard anything with regards to fans and capacities uh, in Saskatchewan? And if not, give me a little bit of an update on what's going on with the junior ranks that Mike hasn't touched on yet. Um, well, my understanding was that we're not far away from there being 50% capacity possible if um, you're allowed to to distance properly. So I, I, I haven't delved into it to the degree that Mike would have, but uh, from conversations I've had with some people, like if you have a building with, you know, not 50%, but you can have up to 1,200, I think, if you have a building that is large enough to properly distance, that that's coming by November. I, I believe. Yeah. So it, the, the way that the document is worded is that they're capping attendance at 150. If you do not have the ability to assign seats, right. if you can assign seats, then they're going to allow you to have 50% capacity maximum, but you still have to adhere to some social distancing rules where, you know, it's every other uh, row and you're allowed to sit within an extended household bubble but then if you go by yourself, you still have to make sure that there's two seats empty beside you. And I don't really know how teams are going to necessarily assure those things. But, but by and large, the, the teams that I've talked to have said that it probably won't be 50%. It'll be closer to 40% when you take into account, well, I, I can only do every other row. I can't do every seat in every other row. I've got to leave some blank. So we're probably looking at closer to 35 to 40%, which 
again, in SGHL communities, um, you know, if, if you could put 50% in, I think they would be happy with that. Um, 35 to 40, I think, you know, you can play. The West yeah. Hockey League, though, did, by the way, today come out with an announcement yeah. that they've once again delayed the start of their season. They're moving it back from December 4th all the way to January 8th. The thought process being that kids will come back from Christmas, join their teams for a brief training camp, and then be set to start the regular season on the 8th. The other piece of news uh, from that announcement today is that the WHL plans to play um, only regionally. So the Swift Current Broncos, who were a Central Division team last season, are in the East Division this season. And the seven teams that will now comprise the East Division in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, in theory, if this all works out, would only play each other. The five teams in the Central Division, all from Alberta, would only play each other. The five teams in the BC Division would only play each other. And the five teams in the American Division would only play each other. Who knows what will happen then come playoff time, the way the playoffs are set up in the league. You could certainly just have a divisional playoff and then have the winners come out and do some kind of bubble, perhaps, unless things had advanced by that point. The bigger issue is going to be uh, immediately, can you even have Manitoba, Saskatchewan travel? Because my understanding is so far that's not being allowed in the rules for either Manitoba or Saskatchewan. And will they be able to get the players into the, the, the seats or into their homes? And part three, you mentioned 30 to 35 percent, Mike. If that's all they're going to be allowed for fans, the Western Hockey League has said they can't operate unless they have at least 50 percent capacity. So there's still a lot to be decided. And I think pushing it back the way they have is just giving them more time to hope that things change. Let's take a quick break, everyone. Let's come back. Let's revisit the same topic. Ryan, I want to get you in because I'm curious to see how, if the OHL will use uh, the MGHL and also other junior programs as a template for moving forward. So hang on, guys. Staying late after work yesterday and I missed the game, so I'm watching the replay now. Isn't that just a highlight, though? That's one of the best things about ASTV. They have full broadcasting coverage of all the pre-game and post-game shows, so I can watch wherever I want, whenever I want. That sounds lame. No, it doesn't. That sounds really cool. What else do they have? I'm glad you asked, because they have play-by-play, -play, color commentating, up to nine camera angles, interviews, online shows, and much more. Whatever. I have no idea what that means. Basically, if you're a sports fan, ASTV is the place to go. They have everything you want. Didn't Mom get mad at you for the last subscription you signed up for? Yeah, Mom's gonna kill you if she finds out you pay. Yeah, she probably would, except I haven't told you the best part yet. ASTV is completely free. Really? She's gonna be super happy to hear that. Exactly! Now I can cancel all my other subscriptions because ASTV covers it all. Let's watch the game. So Ryan, if you're, so before I get to Ryan, Harry, give me a rundown. How did those first couple games feel, look, uh, and precautions that were taken into account this weekend for you guys in Winkler? Honestly, it felt, like I said, pretty normal. I mean, once you get to the rink, you know, we, we scan in, we fill our, our little COVID uh, online form, um, actual game protocols. I think the only thing that was different, which I didn't even notice the first game, is that linesmen now drop the puck always and refs don't. Other than that, to be honest, like we were in Nipah, they had a good crowd. We played here on the Saturday. We had a pretty good crowd. 
Um, as far as I know, there was no issues. Um, yeah, like to be honest, uh, if you were to walk into the rink other than wearing a mask, it felt extremely normal. So it was kind of nice. Ryan, you mentioned there's alternative avenues being explored. I know we talked about four on four hockey, perhaps privately, and different non hockey Canada sanctioned leagues. Would there be a benefit to doing something like that just to get players on the ice waiting for January? Or is it now one of those things where we're, you know, we're looking at middle of October, we've got two months plus a Christmas break. Do we just wait and have an elongated development camp for a lot of these players and just, you know, buy time for a January start? Well, I know a lot of the junior teams in the uh, tier two level um, have all their players that, are eligible to be there, the ones that are in Canada. Um, and they're doing regular skates, just preparing for when um, the provincial guidelines allow them to start playing games. Um, I do know that some of the teams out east uh, in the Ottawa area previous to this past week, um, because uh, Ottawa region, the Toronto region, and Peel, which is Mississauga, have recently shut down for the next 28 days. So there's no... There's no nothing. You're not allowed to do anything, and all the arenas are shut, so there's nothing. But um, in terms of just their, their planning, these uh, these uh, ro- I don't want to say rogue leagues because they're not really rogue because, I mean, there's no season going on. So a lot of uh, entrepreneur hockey minds are throwing leagues together to provide the opportunity for kids to skate. And there has been some, some pushback from – some of the governing bodies saying that if you skate in these, you're not going to be allowed to, you know, go, come to play when the seasons actually begin. And um, a lot of people are saying, you know, they don't believe that the seasons are going to happen here in Ontario just because the rules are, are crazy. I mean, I'm sure that you guys all seen that the minister of sport jumped on and said, yeah, OHL, you can play hockey this year, but you're not allowed to body check. Like, let's be realistic. That's, that's not that's not something that's uh, that's going to work out. No, absolutely not. There's got to be some contact. Sean, you're familiar with the uh, election that's upcoming here in November and for Saskatchewan. And how much do you think a political role plays in this matter? Because, I mean, you're we've heard that Saskatchewan's might be waiting for a decision like that. I mean, does that play a part in this allowing of players to enjoy a sport they love? I'm sure it does. And I, I don't want to speak for anybody involved and put words in their mouth, but you would have to think if you're the governing SAS party, which just ideologically would tend themselves to be maybe more likely to allow um, more open hockey being to be played, you know, just sort of based on the way this has worked from an ideological perspective. If you're the SAS party and you lighten the rules up big time, a month before the election, and then all of a sudden there's a number of outbreaks connected to hockey, you're probably concerned how that could impact your uh, electoral fortunes. So they're likely playing it as safe as they can now, and it's not surprising that the dates for when you're allowed to do certain steps come after the election, which they're most likely going to win, although you know elections are hard to predict at times, and they don't want to do anything that could mess with that. Mike, you and I have talked about the fact that kids are in school, kids are doing their thing, they're having a little bit of normalcy back. Why can't they include hockey yet? I don't know. <laughs> and, <laughs> it's a simple know, question. I, asked, I could ask that to everybody. I mean, yeah, even the kids yeah. in Whistler and Morton, I mean, they're high school kids. They spend time in the classroom. I mean, you've got issues where you can't have Pemina Valley teams playing against CSSHL teams. You've got two kids going to school in Toronto. Every single high school has got kids. Uh, I, I you choose not to go, and then all of a sudden, boom, you can't go to the rinks? Yeah, I, I, and I recognize that this probably isn't a very popular opinion that people want to say publicly, but I don't think it's about health anymore. I don't. I, don't I mean, if, I if, if you look at the inconsistencies of the rules, how can you proclaim this to be about health? Like, like Saskatchewan the other day just reduced – private gatherings in the home to 15. But you can have 25 or 30 kids in the same classroom. Health? I mean, yeah. show me the science that, right? And, and you could do that all the way 
uh, across the board with, with just about anything. You know, the, 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 the biggest thing that disturbs me is I've talked to a couple of politicians in the last couple of weeks, and both of them basically told me um, that what's driving this at the, at the present time is mainstream media and social media that is just on you like pressure that you wouldn't believe. And if Saskatchewan was to open up, and I'm led to believe that by and large, most of the politicians behind the scene in the SAS party do want the province fully open, but they can't because the moment that one 85-year-old person who's in a long-term care home passes away, the frenzy from the mainstream media is so harsh that it costs people their jobs and it costs people their reputations. And it, and it's, we talk about cancel culture, but it's very real. And I believe in Saskatchewan anyway, that that is a big part of what's holding this back is that we don't really know how to harness social media, mainstream media to the point that says, okay, is that really how most of us feel or are they ideologically driven uh, for a minority group of people, and how do we sort through that? And I, I, I just, I, I just feel like, like, for for a number of months already, this isn't about health anymore. This is about politicians that have painted themselves into a politically correct corner, and they can't get out. I think if I were to play devil's advocate a little bit with the difference between classrooms and private gatherings and hockey, I mean, clearly hockey is something that all of us on this panel value very significantly and a, an opportunity to gather with our, van, our family is something we would all value significantly. I think, again, playing devil's advocate, if you were to take the perspective of the public health official on why they differentiate, it's mainly the necessity of the education versus the necessity of the other items that they are very important, but not necessarily as, uh, as much a necessity in that for example, from an economic standpoint, if you shut down schools as we did back in the spring, all of a sudden, a huge number of people who are working families now have to figure out what do I do with my kids? How do I look after them? What happens to them? Can I work? And, you know, how far behind did they get in school, et cetera, et cetera. Now, again, I'm not downplaying the importance of sports or the importance of gathering with your family for Thanksgiving or Christmas. But they'll come back and say, those aren't a necessity to the same level that a regular education would be. And I think that's the argument they're going to make and what the difference is. The challenge they have, as we've said on, you know, repeatedly in these conversations, is trying to understand the different rules for the different industries and why the different industries, the different public health sectors, the, the different spectrums, seem to have different rules that don't necessarily line up or make sense because i think everybody is still making this up as they go along mm -hmm. and they're trying to do the best they can without getting you know caught in the meat grinder of as soon as you make a mistake you know now you're accused of killing people you know so they're they're really gingerly trying to work their way through this with no precedent at how to do it and it's been a an, an immense challenge whether you're a conservative politician or a liberal one, uh, they're all really finding it difficult to find consistency of message. Harry, how impressive was it to see the boys play hockey, see the smile on their face, a regular season game, and just those shoulders finally drop a little bit and get to enjoy, from a coach's perspective, just the enjoyment of the game back on the ice? Uh, it was great, to be honest. Like I'm, I'm very much over the the COVID talk, you can see when we talk about that, I, I don't have a lot to say. You know, I'm, I'm just a hockey coach. So okay, I'm bringing it back to hockey, man. Yeah. When it goes back to, like, you know, I think we all would rather talk about the ins and outs of just the game and put this behind us. But, no, it's, you know, something we we deal with, obviously, day to day, but we don't we don't talk about it anymore, right? We're, we're in our little bubble, and we the guys, I, like, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. It feels very normal. Um, you know, we, we don't want them going out in the public as much. You know, there's no reading in the classrooms. We, you know, we don't really help with minor hockey. Um, but, you know, those are small little things we're doing. Um, yeah, you know, two wins. You know, the guys are the guys are feeling great. Hopefully, you know, they don't get carried away and 
and you know stuff to kind of bend the rules here a little bit. But as far as I know, the league's doing a great job kind of managing everything. Everybody's taking it serious, and the guidelines aren't that hard to be honest. If you just you know do the simple little protocols, it's like I said, it's very routine. I feel like Saskatchewan would be very much in the same boat. Um, once you're there, you don't think about it. And I think that's the best part about it is it's not on my mind every day. It's COVID, COVID, COVID. Now I come to the rink and I talk hockey. And then I and I go home and I, you know, I, I just get ready for the next day. I don't really watch the news anymore. I you know, just put the pin on all that. And, yeah, to me, this is hockey season. And this is what I enjoy the most. And, you know, I don't want to claim that I'm just being ignorant to everything else, but – I know it's serious. I'm, I'm doing everything I can and then just moving on and, and enjoying my life as much as I can in a normal sense. Fabulous. We're going to take a quick break again. We're going to get back to these hockey topics. I don't know if you figured it out, but there was a free agency period that started last week as well as a draft. So we're going to talk about some an interesting phrase that I kept hearing over and over uh, last week. We can come back here for the second period. Stay with us here on Coaches Parlay. All right, we got a chance to grab a glass of water, change a little bit, see what's going on. We're back to talking about hockey. We've got a couple of coaches, a couple of guys that watch it from the stands, and probably better to say 150 years of experience between the five of us when it comes to loving this great sport. I kept hearing during the draft that you can condition an athlete and you can teach a kid skating. Those are the two easiest things to teach a kid coming out of a draft. Um, did any of you guys pick that up? I don't know if I believe it or not, but if it's not one of those two ideas of conditioning an athlete or skating, is it something you still can teach a 17-year-old uh, if they're there to make the next step, or is it already a foregone conclusion? I'm going to start with Sean on this. I'm going to go to uh, Ryan afterwards because I want to hear your thoughts from two different perspectives, whether or not you think that is a true statement or it's something that is – a little more difficult than we've seen. Sean? As someone who's never been a high-level uh, hockey player myself, to, to jump in and say, you know, which skills are more teachable than others, it's difficult. But what I'll say is, um, A, I think conditioning is something, you know, I guess conditioning is something you can achieve, even if it's not as easy for you as it is for someone else. But there are some athletes who are more likely to be uh, highly conditioned than others. So you can't just snap your fingers. You know, there's some people that can't lose weight to save your life. Some people can't gain weight to save their life. Some people who are naturally endurance have natural endurance, some people who don't. So to say that's just teachable, I think it's more teachable than goal scoring instincts, but it's not just snap your fingers teachable. As for skating, there are examples of poor skaters that have put a ton of work into it and become NHL quality skaters. I think right in my own backyard, Adam Lowry, when he was a 16-year-old with the Broncos, was nowhere near a good enough skater to make it to the next level and work doggedly in power skating. I mean, the resources he had, his father, a former National Hockey Leaguer, but he worked his tail off and he became a skater that was worthy enough to be the MVP of the Western Hockey League and, and now a regular uh, National Hockey League player. But at the same time, I've also seen... And I don't want to name names, but I've seen some prospects who've come down the line where people have said, if only he could skate, but he's really going to work on it. It's going to come and it just never gets there. Some guys just can't reach that no matter how hard they work, that natural skating stride just isn't there. So is it possible? Yes. But to say, oh, all they have to do is work and it'll come. That's not necessarily true. I could work every day all of my life, and I would never even come close to the level of uh, an NHL player. Ryan, give me your thoughts on this. I mean, you've officiated the game. You've probably seen players grow up through their years. I know you've coached players, and you've brought them into camps yourself, being a head coach too. Would you rather have a player that has a good, strong work ethic, knowing that they can get themselves in game shape, 
Or do you look at that guy that just can't skate to save their life and those three quick steps just aren't there? Which one would you feel more comfortable improving as a head coach? Well, I think I think the skating can be changed and can come. And, I mean, I've seen players who put in the, the amazing work in the off season, and there's a lot of amazing skilled coaches uh, out there that uh, they make a living off of uh, improving people's strides. Um, I'm not going to give anybody free plugs uh, on the show because uh, I think they'll probably have to pay for it. But uh, the uh, the opportunity for these guys with what's available in terms of off ice and uh, the instructors uh, during the off season and the work that can be put in, um, I've seen dramatic changes in a lot of hockey players uh, over a summer and translates into some really really good success. I've also seen some of the ugliest skaters in the history of hockey put up the most points and, you know, coaches overlook it because they get to A to B really, really equally as good as a lot of other people. And it might uh, not look pretty, but at the end of the day, if you get the job done, I think that's, uh, that's all that matters in my books. Mike, you come from a little bit of an old cloth, so to speak, uh, being the old guard on the, on the show. If you had to, if you didn't have to pick one of these and Sean brought up the idea of instinct, Instinct can get you a really long way, but what separates the oil from the water is those smaller intangibles. Uh, like you said, 20 years ago, we never, we rarely saw kids spend off-ice training in the gym. It's become a foregone conclusion now. Is that because the programming and development has looked at hockey being, for lack of a better term, a 24-7 style sport where everything you do – is breathing getting better on the ice? I think there's some of that, but I think the other thing that I, and I mean, there's different levels, right? Like if we're talking junior A, I always like to use the term hockey IQ. If you, if you can't go from A to B as fast as the next guy, are you smart enough to maybe take a different path so it doesn't take, you know, so that you, you, you're still going to win that foot race to the puck or you're, you're thinking the game a little bit faster. So you've got a head start on somebody that might skate a little bit faster than you. Um, you know, when you get into the NHL and, and, you know, the Western Hockey League, there's a, there's a whole bunch of other factors I think that come into play. But for me, I always talk about hockey IQ. And then I, and then the other thing that you'll hear coaches sometimes talk about, can you play with pace? And that doesn't always mean skate fast, but can you can you keep up in your own way? And and some guys have different ways with, with which they do that. And I remember uh, a few years ago, and I I, I will name him Riley Storzik was a, a really good player for the Flin Flon Bombers, and he wasn't a good skater, but he was smart, and and he just knew where he needed to be at the right time, and he made sure he was there, and you know, that probably doesn't take him any further in hockey, but people also got to remember if you, if you play junior a hockey until you're 20 years old, it's nothing to be ashamed of. You're a pretty good hockey player. Yeah. Harry, remember how many hours you spent in the gym when you were in a junior player? Yeah, roughly, I guess. Roughly. <laughs> Is it roughly the same amount on the ice? Um, no, I mean, no. just listen to the conversation. Um, I think you can teach literally everything um, in the game of hockey, but you can't teach drive and commitment. <clears throat> I mean, people say they work hard, but they really don't know. Like, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to live with an Olympian. And I thought I worked hard, not even close. You know, the elite yeah, of the elite. You've got some pretty good shoes to follow. I mean, well, uh, you know, your, just, your better uh, half has got quite the regiment. I've seen it on TV. I've seen it on online, and you've told me she, she works her butt off. It's, yeah, it's another level. So when people say, like, for example, I grew up in a small town. I thought I did literally everything I could. I'd go to the gym, I'd do bench press, and then I'd eat a cheeseburger for protein. And that's what I thought what people were doing. I didn't have the information. I didn't have the conditioning coach. I didn't have the skating coach. You know, YouTube was, I don't even think it was a thing. I would just go off what my parents would tell me. Oh, you got to eat more to get bigger. Okay, go to the gym, lift weights. I did everything wrong. Did I work hard? Yeah, but. I did everything, you know, you're looking back at it. Okay, I, I did everything I could, but if I had the right information, if I had the right coach, 
to just say, no, you can't eat a cheeseburger after a workout. I don't care if you think that's protein. So I, I really think you can, you can develop better players, but you know, people think yeah, I'm working hard, but you know, you can have, you know, Scotty Bowman as a coach. If you don't show up to the rink to, on time to practice, he's not going to help you. So for me, I think you know, when they talk about you can teach conditioning, yeah, like, of course. I mean, I just, I really just finished a workout because I'm getting older and now I don't want my body to decline because I'm living with somebody who's in way better shape than me, but you know, different, <laughs> different motivation. So I think when you're a kid, a lot of these guys think they know what they're doing, you know, but they really have no idea. And that's where a good coach, you know, can just kind of open your eyes to your deficiencies. I mean, I just had a meeting with our defenseman today. I said, I think the hardest thing for players that they think to do is properly evaluate themselves. They're either way too hard on their game or way too lenient. And that's where a good coach can say, hey, that was fine. And you know what? You think this is a strength, but it's really not. So, yeah, to go back to the original question, I honestly think you can, you can teach every part of the game, but it's totally up to the athlete to do all they can to, to make those improvements. They have to have that open mind. They have to have that opportunity to uh, give themselves the chance to rethink something that might be of better value or uh, increased value to they can add to their game. Uh, Harry, I don't want to give a plug out, but I don't see the cheeseburger wrapper in your uh, post-workout regimen there. Oh, there it is. Oh, you got the protein shake now. Okay, here we go. That's the Thanksgiving diet. I had to, you know, you put yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. too much chip to pan and turkey. I know, I know. Uh, Mike, real quick, you bring up the idea of IQ. And, I mean, I've played with some great players that have had dangles galore, terrible skating. I've seen Scott Niedermeyer work in the gym for hours in Anaheim, uh, working with the Ducks and the Kings back in my early days of strength and conditioning. What does it mean when you figure out a player doesn't have that drive? What do you tell them to say – you need to open up this locker or else. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> th th those conversations get harder and harder to have with each passing year. I mean. Is it because kids yeah. are too sensitive now? Like, I mean, is that the yeah, reason we're why? Soft. I mean, we're, we're a soft society. We are. And you, you tell you tell someone something that they don't want to hear, um, they'll quit. You know, and, and, you know, whereas, you know, a few years ago, um, the mentality would be, well, no, I'll show you, right? You don't think I have the drive, I'll show you. Now we see, you know, and, and I don't know, and I don't think that that's a kid's fault necessarily. I, I, I blame us. I, I, you know, I mean, let's face it. I'm, you know, I'm the parent of a, of a 19 year old, a 16 year old, and a 14 year old. And, and, um, you know, the onus is on us as, as parents to to raise our kids properly and and to um, you know when they're when they're challenged like that to respond appropriately and not melt down and, and uh, go away. But but even you know there's a lot of adults that are in their 40s that are my age that melt down when they're told something that they don't particularly like to hear. So it's it's not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, you'll, you'll sometimes hear uh, the comment, you know, I'll, I'll hear a junior coach every once in a while. I don't hear it as much, but they'll say when they're talking about a certain player, they'll say, oh, he's a throwback. And that, that really only means about 15 years ago. <laughs> like it's really when they, when, like yeah. when I think throwback, I think, oh, it's from the 60s, guys that didn't wear helmets. But when they say throwback, they just mean, you know, a guy with tenacity that's, you know, from 2005 is really what they're talking about. And I, and I, and I don't know, it's funny too, because, you know, a lot of the junior A coaches and Harry might fall into this um, where I, I, and I, and I remember watching Harry play a little bit, actually, that tells you how old I am, but I'll, I'll run into some of the coaches and they'll talk about, Oh, so-and-so is soft or, or this guy's, you know, makes it challenging to get him to be motivated. And then I'll say, yeah, and you know what? Your coach, I remember talking to your coach about you, and he said the same thing about you when you played. But somehow he got through to you. So I think sometimes, as you know, as, as you know, coaches like Harry that are getting into the game now, I think, you know, the good ones that are honest with themselves can sort of look back, draw, and, okay, well, what, what got me to the point that I needed to get to to get that drive and, and to get to the next level where I wanted to be. One thing that Ken Pearson told me, uh, I think it was last year, 
which he said, the one thing that the kids of today have that the kids of yesterday didn't have is kids of today really want to know why. They want to learn and they want you to explain to them why. And once they understand that, they'll go through a wall for you. Whereas the kids of yesteryear, you just tell them what to do. They don't question it. They just do it. And, and I know Ken had said, he said, you know, I really like being able to sit someone down and say, this is what I need you to do. This is why I need you to do it. Here's the evidence on the why. And he says, by and large, most kids, after they, they collect all that information, they tend to be pretty good. I, I just want to jump in if I can quickly and say, you know, I do think attitudes have changed. And I do think it is harder to, to critique. But at the same time, we were talking about hard work. I would argue, again, not as someone who was a high level athlete myself, but just anecdotally, with the amount of work that goes into being a hockey player these days, they probably work harder than hockey players have ever had to work in the history of the game, given 12 months of the year, you know, seven days a week, they're at the gym, they're skating, they're working out all summer, they're skating a lot of the summer, they're working on video, they're working on deficiencies. These guys are, you know, built out of granite that are coming into training camp like that. Whereas in, you know, you hear stories in the seventies of, you know, fat hockey players coming to work themselves into shape with cigarettes dangling out of their mouth. So, you know, we can long for the, the uh, days gone by and maybe the, the type of game that was played at the time or the attitude was more in line with the, you know, the throwback nature of the sport. But I do think the players today work harder than anyone, uh, any of them ever probably have. Also, on, on that note, sports, sports are the only thing where you're constantly told how hard it is to become an athlete. So from the second year 12, you tell your teacher, hey, I want to be a pro athlete. Well, here's a chart about the percentage of players that make it. But, you know, you tell your teacher, I want to be a doctor, and it's just as hard. But it's something about sports that people always want to throw in the face how hard it is. So how motivated are kids going to be when by the time they're 15, probably 90% of people have said, well, what's your plan B? You know, I think the reason why I'm still involved in hockey is I was very, like, I lived my whole philosophy that I'm going to, you know, live and die on this ice. And, you know, I, I've been lucky enough to do it since I was four. I never took a year off. And, you know, my dad till this day still says, oh, what's the plan B? And I go, I don't really have one, Dad. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm, still having, I'm still having fun with plan A. <laughs> so, like, yeah. I, I plan on moving up the ranks. Like, it's, you know, I'm back to where I started 14 years ago. You know, every day is, is great. But... I just remember from 14 on, you know, playing in my small town law, like, Harry, you know how hard it is to be that? My mom said, hey, you should be a doctor. Well, that's pretty hard too, you know? So it's something about sports where the motivation lasts because we're constantly telling kids, you're probably not going to make it. Ryan, what's your idea of throwback? I mean, you've gone through, I mean, different provinces, different areas of Manitoba and Ontario. Do you like the throwback comments and – What's your take on how far back do you go for a throwback? I mean, me being 37, I look at as an era that I was, uh, it was always do what you're told and don't ask questions. And the ones that didn't ask questions and did what they're told were usually the ones that advanced and moved on. And in that era, it was the ones that asked questions. I wanted to know why are usually the ones that got shunned. And you could see that the pendulum has swung and uh, Ken Pearson has been around through all those different areas. Um, I'm sorry, Ken, I'm not calling you old, but um, you have, you know, seen multiple different things. Um, Ken's bang on accurate about it. Uh, The players today want information. um, They want visual. They want to see and they want proof. And if you can show them proof, then you're going to earn their trust. You earn their trust, then you're going to have success and they're going to play harder for you. Um, but if you don't have their trust and you don't show them why, um, they're going to second guess you and they're going to shut down. And I want guys that, uh, that, that want to want that information, want that push. And I want guys that also are, uh, are athletes and want to work. You know, I want guys to show up to the rink every day and want to put in, put in the work and tie their work boots, punch the clock and, and, and do what you got to do. You know, I don't want pretenders. I, I, I like calling hockey players pretenders. There's a lot of them out there that show up to the rink and they pretend like they're, 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 they're going to compete every day. And they don't. You know, and then you show them video, oh, well, you know, this happened and there's an excuse. Or, 
you know, excuses are ridiculous. And um, coaching, especially at the tier two junior A level, is uh, is extremely difficult. It's not hard because you're dealing with a lot of different attitudes and a lot of different mentalities and a lot of guys who think, well, you know, I should be playing here, but I'm stuck here. So, you know, maybe they don't give their, their full attention and their full efforts because they're still disappointed that they got cut from their, their major junior team or, you know, they, they should be somewhere else. And they don't really think that they have to, to work hard because they're labeled as who they are. And, that's the era that we live in. And Mike hit the nail on the head. Uh, you know, when he said, well, Ken, it's, it's a tough world and it's a tough grind. And, you know, um, and for the last eight years I, I, I coached and I'm quite thankful that I COVID hit cause I get a break. So, um, yeah, I, that's my story. I guess Very just to uh, finish this off with a bit of a funny story was, uh, a player in junior a last year, um, they were doing some video work and uh, the player had hung on to the puck a little bit too long. He'd entered the offensive zone and ended up kind of in the corner and didn't, you know, a couple of guys open in front of the net. Instead, he kind of forced the issue, took a bad angle shot and was an easy save for the goaltender. The coach said to him, they said, you know, as they're showing him the video and pointing some things out, the coach said, so what do you think you should have done here? And the kid said, score. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> we always could use a little more scoring and like we all said back in the day we did we listened to what we were supposed to do and we did what we were told and if i can quote a great movie from boulder just remember don't think just do and rosebud goes to the front big guy we'll come back <laughs> third period we're going to talk about something we haven't done all of us and that's travel here on coaches parlay third period action here we got quite a good discussion with thank you everyone for shouting out uh unless outside of ryan and sean because i know sean was able to get to ontario for a bit business and pleasure i'm assuming we haven't done much travel and we're not seeing many of these teams being able to travel do we see the train the airplane the bus having that opportunity to cross provincial lines in the near future. I know with Manitoba, they're playing a 40 game season, right? Harry, they play within their medical region. They play each team eight times. They go for a home and home for two games. Really not that much. Uh, we look at the SJ. I mean, the Flint Fawn bombers potentially might be playing out of Creighton or might have to do some finagling with that boys. But an Ontario shut down for 28 days, right, Ryan? So we can't really do much with travel that aspect. You look at from, you know, I look at uh, Ottawa to London, Ontario, very similar to San Francisco to San Diego. It's just straight up the 401, the 403. And there's many towns going north and south right along that pathway. Guess I'll start with you, Sean and Mike. Do you see... Right now, Saskatchewan's in a holding pattern. They're not leaving Saskatchewan. They might not even be playing outside of regions. 
will that stay for the remainder of the season, do you think? Or will they offer an opportunity to expand that perhaps and see teams play outside of region in Saskatchewan in the SJ? Really? Really, I think it depends on, on, on numbers. As simple as that. I think as time goes on, they're going to be more and more willing to, to explore alternatives. But if Alberta has a much higher level of infection than Saskatchewan and Manitoba, they're not going to, they're not going to go there. If BC has a much higher level of infection, they're not going to go there. I mean, we're talking about restrictions in, in junior and junior a of being within your own province. I think we very easily could see by the time the national hockey league is ready to come back and play, they're going to have, Canadian teams playing only each other until they can get this border figured out. And that would be, I don't even know how to conceive that nation, that notion, given the distance between the teams in, in Canada and then the idea of playing two separate leagues in two separate countries. The Blue Jays weren't allowed to travel back and forth on a consistent basis. So things are going to have to change in a very significant way or, or government thinking is going to have to change in a very significant way for there to be consistently allowed travel for sports now i think players themselves will be allowed to come in to go where they're meant to play you know if you're a, an american or a canadian that needs to go to a, an american or canadian city or somewhere else in the country you can go to where you need to go but team travel i think we're a long way away from that mike was there anything in that document that said anything about travel or any discussions in terms of potentials well I also wear a hat with senior hockey and the league that I'm involved with, we have a number of teams on the border. So we've got, um, you know, for those that are familiar, we got Mooseman, Langenberg, Rokenville, and they're all right along the Manitoba border. In the case of, of uh, Rokenville and Mooseman in particular, they draw from, from Manitoba, Rokenville out of the Russell area, Mooseman draws from Brandon. Now those, my understanding is that the teams themselves are not welcome in the Manitoba league and Manitoba teams aren't welcome in a Saskatchewan league. But I have an email, I have it in writing, where uh, Sask Hockey has said they will allow individual Manitoba players to play for Saskatchewan teams at the senior level. Um, so assuming that that's okay, then, you know, there's no issue there. I think when it comes to travel with the SJHL, I think that's part of the protocols. And I think... Um, you know, if, if, uh, what I'm anticipating is going to come to pass, they're going to be allowed to travel. Flynn Flan going to be allowed to play in the Whitney forum. They're going to get to kind of have the Lloyd minister situation where they pick which province they want to have the rules for. And then obviously it'll be Saskatchewan. Um, and I, and I, and I think, you know, they're, they're going to be allowed to do it. There's some, some stuff in the document with regards to how they want the players to be situated on the bus uh, to make sure that there's enough space with the players on the bus. There's also some, some information there with regards to meal times and, and how they want the meals dispersed. And if you are in a hotel, how they want that to go. But I know from our perspective in the SJHL, we're trying to avoid hotel stays as much as possible um, in the, in the schedule, at least delay it until much later in the season. So I think, as far as the SJHL is concerned, I don't foresee them allowing travel, you know, into another province. And for, for now, I don't really need to anyway. Um, the only time that would come up would be in a situation with the Nanavet Cup. The, the one that's going to be interesting, and, and Sean mentioned it, is the East Division in the Western Hockey League. You got Brandon and Winnipeg, and then you got Saskatchewan team. And so if we're going to let them go back and forth, don't we have to let everybody or the virus only travel with non-Western Hockey League teams? I think it's, I think it's uh, the, the virus, as we found out, is very selective on who it wants to infect. It took off the championship weekend in Los Angeles. It, wasn't it did. For some reason it did. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. Uh, with, your, with Harry, with you yeah. traveling to Nipawa and back, I mean, you get that home and home out of the way. Uh, but that was a little bit different scheduling for you because usually you would play – you know, you go to Nipawa, you might play way, way, you might go up to Dauphin, you might play two or three games in a weekend and kind of knock three teams out on your sketch. Can't do that now. So, and no uh, hotel stays. Uh, well, funny, we, we play Nipawa again, home and home, home and home this weekend too. So we play them four times. <laughs> so, I mean, 
again, I'll take it over no hockey. It's a good rivalry. You know, they have, they have a good team, so it's fun. I think our division is going to be very competitive with Portage and Verdun. So, you know, we're lucky that at least we're in a competitive division where every game is going to be tight. I know the division, uh, you know, Steinbach's got the two city teams in Selkirk. I think they won something like 7 nothing and 7-1. So that could get tough. But, um, no, we, we do have a trip up to OCM in the new year. They did delay that. So it's just a one-night hotel. That's the only one we have. Originally, we had about three. So, again, that's in the new year where things might be a little better. But, I mean, every trip is you're in and out in the Manitoba Junior League. So it's it's not too bad. Not too bad. Ryan, after this 28-day break that happens, uh, what do you envision happening in the future? Or is it something that's still going to just wait till the new year, perhaps, or not even happen at all? Well, if I was a betting man, I would say that uh, junior hockey at the Tier 2 level in, in at least the OJ is going to be very, very – Small. I think you're going to get maybe a 24 game season at best, and um, I, I truly believe that there'll be no traveling outside of the the divisions that are offered. Um, I know the Junior B League is gearing up like they're starting tomorrow, which is going to be very difficult for them to do because they have so many teams in all different parts of uh, of Ontario, and the Junior C Hockey Leagues. It's they're they're not planning on playing anything until once the junior A and junior B leagues start, because the trickle-down effect still needs to happen. Why hasn't there been, Ryan, I'm going to stay with you for a sec, why hasn't there been an update from Hockey Canada? Is it just the fact that they're just allowing the provincial health departments to conduct how they see fit groups of people getting together and activities to occur? Why aren't they, why aren't they advocating health? Oh, that's, well, right that's a mic question, I'm sorry, but I want to get Ryan's perspective on this. Well, Right, right now in Ontario, I mean, we, we can't have more than 50 people in an indoor facility. So, I mean, you, you add two teams, uh, referees, trainers, uh, you know, the, those numbers add up pretty quick, right? So, I mean, I know that there's beer leagues going on where you can have no more than 11 players, and that includes your goalie and refs. So, I mean, it's, um, it's more of both the provincial government here in Ontario than it is anything else. Because, I mean, if the leagues could start tomorrow, I know each and every one of them would want to get going because they're all prepared and ready to go. But basically, if you try to do it, the the Ontario Hockey Association won't allow it, which is the governing body for the OJ, the Junior B, and the Junior C teams in and around Toronto. You've got Ottawa that wants to get going as well, but since the government has put the restrictions down, on um, the, that them being shut down for the next 28 days, they can't get going. I mean, that CCHL, they're ready to rock. They want to get going. So it's uh, it's uh, it's a dog's breakfast here in Ontario. And, I mean, um, you guys in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, uh, count your lucky stars because you guys are, are going to get some hockey. And, you know, any kind of hockey that's going to happen here is, is all going to be, you know, under the table hockey this season, I think. Well, you know what? I, I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but if Ontario's playing hockey, that means the rest of us are going. 100%. <clears throat> Ontario is the worst province in Canada as far as allowing things to occur. And there's all sorts of data to suggest lots of questions as to why they're doing what they're doing in Ontario. And... Um, you know, how can you have a major junior league where there's no body checking, but the Western League will allow it? And I know that there's hot spots in Quebec. Quebec is actually the worst province in Canada for virus cases if we're going to get bogged down with cases. Um, but at least the league is trying to do something. So they've, they've started play. Now they're shut down in Quebec. They're shut down until the 28th, but the Maritime Division is allowed to keep going. There's, I think, I think five, there's six teams in the Maritime Division. Moncton's got an issue right now with some cases. So they've grounded Moncton, but they've told the other five they can keep playing. And so for me, while I'd love to complain about that, it's at least a sign that they want to play, that the government officials are saying, look, we're going to let you play to some extent the best that we can let you play. 
Manitoba, we're seeing it. I, I think Manitoba is the model. Uh, you know, if, if, if things are working there, I think a lot of other provinces should look towards adopting that. Um, and as I said before, there's nothing official, but I think it looks promising for Saskatchewan, you know, on the 1st of, of November to get going. Ontario is just, you know, it's our biggest province. The most people in the country live there. I think, you know, most of us, if we're honest, we sort of look at Ontario and think, okay, well, you know what? Once Ontario starts to do things, that's kind of the all clear for everyone else. And yet Ontario is so far behind the other nine provinces. It's actually scary. Well, and I have to ask too, how can we even imagine there being a Memorial Cup this year? If yeah. Quebec has already started, Ontario's talking about not having body contact and the schedules are going to be done the way they're done in these other leagues. I mean, you're not, you're not three leagues playing the same yeah. game anymore. So I think they just have to write that whole concept off. I mean, if Quebec's done their schedule by the time the other leagues are only halfway through, they're not just going to sit around and wait for one. So I think that, I mean, there could be some major junior hockey. I hope there is, but I think a Memorial Cup is a pipe dream. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I don't know how they can, how they can do it. And I, I mean, you know, we could harp on it, but I would love to see the science in Ontario that says that body contact spreads the virus when we've got football happening all throughout the United States and we've got the other hockey leagues going without issue. What, what is it that makes them feel as though they need to put that extra rule in there? I don't understand. Well, one of the reasons Quebec was allowed to play too, is they have to change their fighting rule too. So there's a little bit of a government input on that too. I guess they're going to uh, give them some money and they weren't going to receive it unless they tweak their rules. So that again, Seems more like a, a side agenda than a, yeah. a health than a health related concept. Absolutely, Harry. But I, I have to ask too. Once that door, like once we walk through that door, once these new fighting rules are imposed in Quebec and in Ontario, is that something that we can undo? Because then it'll then it'll be seen as making it less safe. Right? I, I think they're taking this step. Uh, full well knowing the chances are they'll be able to keep those more stringent rules in place and fighting will be almost all but gone for major junior hockey. I think fighting by and large is gone. That's not so much my concern, but if they take body checking out, that's not coming back either. Really? Oh, man. That's I think somebody's body checking Ryan. I think Ryan just said that just can't happen. He's just <laughs> like, no, done for that's it. I'm done. Take body checking out. Then we're taking out, you know, we're taking out the throwback player. It's going to be all oozy goosey. You know, it's all going to have this paradigm or this type casted type of hockey. I agree with all of you. Uh, really, it's, we're going to end it with a quick final shift from all of you guys. Uh, I have to apologize, Harry. I do know what division you're in with Winkler. Uh, I just thought that you were with the, uh, I didn't realize you're going to be playing Nipawa eight times. That's going to be fun, though. I mean, Verdon's going to be a good squad, uh, as well as uh, the fourth team. I forget the fourth team now. Portage. Yeah, Portage, yeah. It's just They sold the farm last year, and they're going to have an interesting time coming back. So with the rest of you, gentlemen, give me an idea. Give me give you about 30 seconds. Give you a minute or so. Tell me what's up in the final shift before we say goodbye. Start with you, Harry. Uh, just a blank, like. No question. Just wrap it up. <laughs> wrap it up. What did you like about last weekend's play? What are you looking forward to? What would be the message you give to the boys playing Nipawa second time around this weekend on the home and home? Uh, don't take them lightly. I mean, we uh, it was a close game Friday. Saturdays, you know, we, we scored some goals. Our goalie, uh, uh, Rude Dick here, is a local kid from Winkler. He's, you know, he's on the NHL radar. We are so lucky to have him, but he's a 16-year-old kid who gets the player of the player of the division for the first weekend. So he's going to be a, an awesome kid to watch. And if you get a chance to see him play, he's going to be he's going to be big for us this year. You got two good goalies there. You got is it, uh, Malin is another good goalie. That yeah, got. yeah, so it's awesome. You know, you know, coaching girls hockey. You know, I just wanted somebody who could save the puck, and now I got two guys who are six five. So, <laughs> so brick walls and the brick walls between the pipes and Winkler. Yeah, I can't, I can't like the New Jersey. Was those New Jerseys you unveiled too? Yeah, yeah, they're they're sharp. I mean, this uh, yeah. is the new logo here with the shield. Yeah. I gotta pick uh, up one of those when I'm down there this weekend, maybe. Yeah, for sure. 
<laughs> well, Strong. Uh, I should note that Dick is a Swifter and Broncos prospect. So That's they're, true, yeah. They're yeah, yeah good good boy. There you go. He knows his stuff. <laughs> they're all excited about him in this neck of the woods. I would yeah. say one, one thing that stood out for me, uh, for years and years and years, we've been hearing about how Canada is getting overtaken. You know, last year, I think we hit a 10-year low in 2019 of Canadian players and CHL players that were taken in the NHL draft. Well, that trend reversed in 2020. 78 Canadian Hockey League players taken out of the 217 uh, draft picks in the NHL draft. Uh, another year for Canadian players where the numbers of Canadian players drafted was right back up the ladder again. And we're so quick to criticize our developmental system and our coaching and our players and the status of uh, hockey in Canada that we should take a second and also note when things have gone the other way and we have something to celebrate and congratulate our coaches and our players about when they have a draft like that. And I think that's a draft worth celebrating. Good call. I think 50% of the first round was Canadian. Yeah. Is that right? Well, there's 31. So I, I don't know. The well, exact close number, to 50. I think it was like 15 or 16 players, right? So, yeah. <laughs> all right, Mr. Mathematician. I know you're going for a school board position. <laughs> okay. I know. Okay. Just that, that. Good job. <laughs> Thank you very much. And if you haven't seen Sean's uh, Mullen, he is re trying to represent a very important position helping the next generation. So please do take time to reach out to him and let him know what's going on. Mike, your final words. Well, I think just, um, you know, in Saskatchewan, I, I've been saying it for weeks uh, that I feel an announcement is coming any day, but I, I truly believe that, um, you know, with the, <clears throat> with the documents that have been released and, and uh, just a matter of getting some of these protocols approved. And you got to remember, um, you know, what, I, what I've said to some people that, you know, what's the holdup? Well, you can't just have uniform rules. If, if you're familiar with some of the ranks, the way that you would put 50% in Melfort isn't the same way that you would put 50% in Weyburn, and it's not the way that you would do 50% in Nippon or LaRange. And so each one of these ranks have to have their own unique you know, entry points, exit points, how they're going to assign seats, you know, extended families, season tickets. Like I know in Yorkton, they've got some luxury suites and they had to clear up, you know, are businesses allowed to use those? And if they are, can they be considered extended family with one another because they work together all day? And so there's there's some of this stuff that, um, you know, just because we don't have a positive announcement, don't take that as a sign of bad news. It just means that they're, they're working through it as they go, and uh, and I believe we're, we're we're close to the end, and I think they're going to be allowed to play. I started doing uh, previews on the on the league website uh, today. I've talked to all twelve teams. They're antsy, they're frustrated, but they're they're very eager to get going. That's good news, Ryan. Your last thoughts before we say good night. I just uh, hope to see some hockey here in all the provinces across Canada. Uh, I know there's a lot of young men out there uh, chomping at the bit to do what they love to do. And uh, let's all hope that uh, uh, politics are put aside and um, we, we do what's best for a lot of these players' mental health and uh, get them on the ice uh, playing what they love playing. Great way to end it up, Ryan. I really appreciate you coming back. I thought I lost you there. You were kind of stuck. Half on the boards, half in the penalty box. I don't know what went on there, but again, just like uh, everything else, we'll blame it on technical difficulties. Thanks for joining me. I'd like to have my first scoring line. Reminds me of NHL 91 when I got my three forwards and my demon all in the offensive zone ready to put the pucks in the net. Thanks for joining us on Coach's Parlay. We'll be back with you in a couple weeks. Enjoy the hockey if you can. Hopefully you get to see some live action soon enough. And take care of yourselves, everyone. Enjoy the uh, wonderful Halloween action upcoming. And have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Talk to everyone soon. Say goodbye, everybody.